Chapter 9 Subnormal They said it again, grumbled Abrian, trying to row. Just keep paddling, said Hono. We'll be rid of them soon enough. Come on, the sailors aren't all that bad, said G.A. That's Rick coming from you, Mr. Bad Luck, said Hono, puffing with effort. And please make your brother stay awake, he added as he pulled a dozing E.A. away from the side of the boat. What did I do? mumbled E.A., shaking himself awake. You're not ill, are you? asked Abrian. You look dead tired. It's because he reads too much, said Gina. Every night and every break he's got that fat blue book under his nose. How do you know? said Hono, twisting round. Because I do, said Gina obstinately. Well, I hope it's a good book, said G.A., grinning as his brother shrank back from their speculation. What's it about? E.A. gave him a long, tired look and yawned. Long words, old writing, he finally said. The shoreline was fast approaching now. A warm squall drove the rain sideways against them and the spray flew into their faces while the dark windows of houses watched them from their harbour front. As they drew nearer, they could spot a person or two making their way along winding paths. From this distance, they seemed to be a well-built, sturdy-looking people, slightly taller than themselves. Images of snowmen began to resurface in Hono, Abrian and Ea's minds, and they wondered if Illar's inhabitants had ever seen a failed notion before. Feeling increasingly nervous, they decided to row away from the village itself and head for a small, rocky inlet. Once they had landed, they would lie low and try to hunt for the Goroma Solskjaer without the islanders knowing they were there. Get off, ocean! shouted Gina, pulling herself upright and immediately getting hit by a second wave. It turned out they were as good at landing a boat as they were rowing it. When they had finally broken free of the surf, G.A. once again kept a lookout as his companions hauled the little boat up the stony beach and did their best to conceal it in the dense trees that hung over the shoreline. The roots of these trees stuck out like long fingers into the water and their leaves were cut in a perfectly straight line by the sea salt. Gina carefully scaled a root and hid the oars one by one as Abrian passed them up to her. Keeping well under the cover of the trees, they crept away from the shore and up a slope. There they found a fallen tree and sat in the earthy bowl at its base with the wall of roots at their backs. So what do we do? asked G.A. keeping low. The Gormasolcia are underground, said Abrian. All the records say there should be a river that runs underneath this island from a spring beneath the hills. So, if we find the spring and follow it underground, said Hano, we should find our first ingredient, finished Ie. Shall we head into the hills then, said Gina, impatient to get moving. Hano shook his head. Think before you run off. We don't know which way to- What are you all talking about? It's hard to say who screamed first or the loudest. Failed notions are surprisingly high-pitched when startled and will scatter in every direction. A young boy was standing a little way above them, a wide grin on his muddy face. The felt notions stayed very still, none of them knowing what to do. You all look soaking, grinned the boy. Are you fish? Hono looked at Abrian. Abrian looked at Ie. Gina looked at Gie, who shook his head desperately. The boy jumped down the slope and strode towards them, still smiling. His hair stuck out at all angles and his clothes had seen all weathers. He appeared to have a sack slung on his back, tied with a sturdy cord. For some reason, he was clutching a bundle of turnips. Oh, look at you, he said. You're all so little and fluffy. This was saying something. He was no taller than them, and his hair was beginning to make G.A.'s feel threatened. Are you murderous? Excuse me, spluttered Hono. You look like murderous. Actually... Maybe just scruzzy lost things. Don't know, can't decide. He stared hard at each of them for five seconds. Wait there! He darted back up the slope and disappeared. Twenty seconds later, he was back. Nah, changed my mind. He can wait. Do you want a turnip? W- what stammered G.A. I was going to feed my pet, but he can wait. He's fat. Do you want a turnip? Why are you offering us turnips? Because you look like one, said the boy. And you look hungry. 
I can't eat turnips, said G.A. as the vegetables were wafted under his nose. Your loss, not mine, shrugged the boy. You look dead anyway. You get benefits for that. I don't mean to sound rude, said Abrian. But please could you go away? I'm giving you food, said the boy, waggling his eyebrows with a wry smile. And you want me to go away? We're quite capable of looking after ourselves, said Hanno. And we're trying not to be noticed. Could you talk a little quieter? Is that better? said the boy, mouthing every word. Oh, you have a tail! His voice shot back to its usual volume level, and his eyes glowed with excitement as he seized Hanno and Gina's tails. Oi! cried Hanno. Get off! growled Gina wriggling free at once, but the boy paid no attention. I don't have a tail, obviously, but I have these, he said, proudly pointing to his back. Close up, what they thought was a sack was actually a large and lumpy mass concealed under his shirt, all bound with rope. The chief likes me to wear this string to make me stand up straight. I don't need it, though. I wear it because they pay me to. (laughs) He cackled gleefully. You have a hunch? asked Abrian, with a momentary glint of curiosity. But it was flattened by the auditory power of the response. Fantastic, aren't I? chuckled the boy, not really listening. I am an upstanding member of my community. I have responsibilities. Everyone says I'm a pain, but that's because they get annoyed quickly. You're doing great, by the way, he added approvingly. My name is Fletch Wazo. Abrian found his hand being shaken enthusiastically. My name's Abrian. Please let go, he said. Will you go away now? Of course, said Fletch, sweeping a bow and handing him a turnip. A gift for you, he said theatrically. Don't feed it to the blue one, though. He doesn't look like he needs it. He shot a significant glance at a very confused G.A. Then, with a flurry of turnips, Fletch scuttled back up the slope and for the second time, vanished from sight. G.A. turned to his friends. Hono and Gina looked like they'd been slapped with a tree. E.A. was removing his fingers from his ears and Abrian was wondering if his still worked. We will all agree, said Hono at last. No matter what happens on this island, whatever we do, we will never see that person again. Having recovered from their noisy introduction to the island, G.A. and the others decided to try and head towards the centre and scout out the hills for any signs of the underground spring. Five hours of walking, stumbling, slipping and falling later proved this had been a bad decision. Any tracks through the island were incredibly muddy, awash with roots, rocks and sludge. All its plant life caved in around them under the weight of the rain, seizing their clothes, tangling their hair, especially Gina's, and dribbling huge raindrops down their necks. By the time they gave up and sat down, they all looked like particularly miserable furry-tailed shrubs. Whose idea was this again? said Abrian as he wiped the mud from his eyes. I want to blame... you, said Hono, scowling at G.A. as he floated beside them, free of both mud and fatigue. Are you absolutely sure you can't go any further? G.A. said cautiously. For all we know, the spring could be literally just around the next corner. Joji Aluitius, said Gina. We are wet, we are tired, and we've been going up the stupid hill all day, and I don't want to climb any more. I was only saying, mumbled G.A. churlishly. We'll have to go back down to the beach, try and find some food, and then work out some other way, because this... Hono plucked a nasty thorn from his foot. This is murder. Murder? Hono's jaw dropped. It couldn't be. Did you say murder? Cackled a voice above them. Fletch was crouching on an outcrop above them, smiling toothily at them. Been having a nice stroll, have we? Gina reached for a stone, but Hono held her back. Are you following us? He shouted. Or is this a game? Me following you? Fletch laughed. I've just enjoyed watching you get lost, that's all. Mr. We can take care of ourselves. You don't know anything about my island, do you? Gina reached for the stone again. 
Honor hesitated before stopping her once more. Come on, let's go back to the beach, said Ie, flat out ignoring Fletch and making a start back downhill. Gie, scare the annoying child away, please. It can't be scary on command, said Gie, very much insulted. You shouldn't go that way. There's a tree gonna snap any minute and squish all of you, you know, called Fletch, fiddling with a wobbly tooth. Go left! None of them listened. Oi! He lobbed a stick at them. Go on! Go left! Abrin glared at him and raised a foot to go left. Not that far left! Down the middle left! No! No! Yes! No! Fletch jumped off his perch and pushed them aside. I just have to do everything, don't I? Come on! Very reluctantly, one by one, Hono, Abrian and their companions followed Fletch as he carved his way through the undergrowth. He hummed as he trotted down a path only he knew and scrambled along through all the colours of damp green that surrounded them. Ea thought they were heading in a different direction to the one they had come up on. After a lot of struggling and stumbling, the forest seemed to clear and widen. Cultivated spaces appeared. These started to weave together into patchwork fields lined with ditches. Then the first building appeared and they stopped dead. We can't go any further, whispered Ea. He's taken us to the edge of the whole village. Fletch looked around. I didn't say you had to follow me all the way. I've been going home. I think we'll have to go into the village, said Hono. We've got no food and no shelter apart from a rowing boat. But we've failed notions. What about our tails? What about Kie? said Ea nervously. Oh, they'll hate you for sure, said Fletch knowledgeably. They're twitchy enough about my back. Whatever you are will probably make them faint, and as for you... What even are you? He asked, staring at G.A. with his head cocked on one side. I'm a ghost, said G.A. curtly. A what? asked Fletch, bemused. Well, you'll have to stuff your tails down your trousers or something. Don't worry, miss, I won't look. Um, I don't know what you'll do, though. He smirked at G.A. It was a very uncomfortable business. Each failed notion felt unnatural and off balance with their tails hidden, and kept a wary eye on any islanders passing them. G.A. tried to make himself as opaque as possible. Thankfully, this happened naturally when he was nervous, and the curtains of rain helped his misty blue form blend in. As they tiptoed into the fringes of the village, people did turn and look over their shoulders at them, but any unfriendly glances seemed to be directed more at Fletch, not themselves. As he strode along in front, he seemed not to care in the slightest and carried on with his chest puffed out. Every now and then he would look over his shoulder and rolled his eyes when he saw they were still following him. The houses around them were tall with pointed roofs, thatched with reeds. There was no sign of a food market or traitors or anything like the noise and smells you'd get in nausea. They might as well set up camp on the beach and hunt for seaweed. Suddenly, Fletch stopped and turned with his hands on his hips. Well, I'm going home. Tiddly pom! He waved and trotted away down the rain-washed path, rounded a corner and disappeared. G.A. and the others looked startled. They shouldn't have been surprised. Fletch led them out of the hills just as he said he would. And they had said they could take care of themselves. The rain grew louder as it redoubled its downpour. Behind them, a door snapped shut and looking around, they realised they were completely alone. Someone's stomach growled. Someone else sneezed. Abrin took out the turnip he'd been given that morning and looked at it long and hard. There was nothing else for it. Apart from that turnip, all they had to eat was their pride. Hono sighed and nodded. As one, they turned and splashed down the path after Fletch. Alariana stretched and sat up in her simple wooden bed. It had been four times since she settled in this little community on the south side of the island, and she was still adjusting to the warmer weather and longer days. It wasn't the kind of warm she experienced on the plains. It was more humid and prone to thunderstorms. She had grown to like the storms on this island, but she had to agree with her neighbours that this latest bout of rain had been going on for far, far too long. Her pregnant neighbour had to throw out her prized plants because the amount of rain had caused them to rot. Thankfully, Alariana still remembered some of her time on the plains with her parents looking after their fields, and so was able to keep her tiny vegetable plot from flooding and rotting. But even if she had managed to fit in here, there was something missing. 
It wasn't home. Sure, she felt comfortable in her house and her neighbours tolerated her, but she missed the shady trees of Feldnor, the smell of spring in the plains, and most of all she missed the anti-tepid revolution. They were the first people to accept her for herself, flaws and all, and who didn't want to take advantage of her. Annie especially had made her feel welcome. Taking off her simple nightgown and putting on her blue-grey dress, she pinned her long hair into a spiral bun on the nape of her neck. Then she took a strip of cloth and tied it firmly around her head, covering her furry ears. She had been taking her second nap of the day, her nights were often disturbed, and now needed to make lunch. Wandering down the stairs, she went into her modest kitchen. Opening her pantry, she pulled out some homegrown vegetables and started chopping them roughly before throwing them into a large pot over the fire. Trying to light it, she accidentally burned her finger. Putting it in her mouth quickly, a gentle knock on the door drew her attention away from her cooking. Need some help, dear? Her neighbour stood in the doorway, hand on her belly, long, blonde hair nearly touching the floor. Yes, please, Nelia, Alariana chuckled. I can never light this without hurting myself. I guess that's one thing Fletch is good for, Nelia said, leaning forward over Alariana's fireplace and snapping her fingers, her pink magic making sparks shoot onto the dry tinder. Alariana rolled her eyes at this slight against her ward. She had taken in an orphan on the island. No one else seemed interested in the poor boy, despite him clearly being homeless and almost starving when she found him. The fire crackled into life and Nelia sat down at the wooden table in the middle of Alariana's main room. Taking a couple of deep breaths, she looked lovingly at her swollen belly. They sure do choose the worst times to kick, huh? Nelia giggled. I wouldn't know. I've never had one on my own. Alariana said as she stirred the stew. Ah yes, I keep forgetting you only adopted Fletch. My brain isn't what it was before I got pregnant. Apparently my mother was the same. Alariana said, stirring some dried herbs and salt into the stew. Perfectly normal, but very annoying. Oh, indeed? Nelia sniffed the air a little as the stew cooked. Alariana couldn't help but smile. Ever since Nelia had become pregnant, she had been craving a lot of the failed notion and plain-style food Alariana made for herself and Fletch, so she made sure to make enough for her neighbour too. Alariana picked out three bowls and some bread made the day before, Setting the table, she went back to the fireplace and spooned out a serving for Nelia. Here you go, Alariana said, smiling. Nelia's eyes widened as she started eating and nearly inhaled the food. Alariana turned to a little pot on top of the fireplace. Lifting the lid, she pulled out the contents, a long cord with a small white figure at the end. It was supposed to be the White Queen, but Alariana wasn't very good at carving. Here is for you. She said cheerily, handing it to Nelia. The pregnant guest stopped eating long enough to see the gift. Her eyes widened. Are you sure? Nelia just about said with her cheeks stuffed full. Of course, Alariana replied, gently tying the cord around Nelia's neck. What is it? Nelia asked blankly. It's a figure of the White Queen. She's a guardian spirit from my home, responsible for protecting the land, pregnancy and childbirth. Oh, Nelia said happily. Thank you. You're well. Alari Mama! A voice cried, accompanied by Fletcher's footsteps storming down the street and a few annoyed cries from people who had to jump out of his way. And here comes the sandstorm, Nelia said, visibly annoyed. Alariana had learned soon after taking Fletch in that most people weren't exactly keen to have him around. The differences that Alariana had grown to love were exactly the differences pushing most of the community away from him. Alari Mama! Fletch shouted, bursting through the door and nearly breaking its hinges. Oh, uh, hello, Miss Nelia. Nelia ignored the pleasantry and finished eating her food. It's been lovely to see you again, Alariana. You too, Nelia. Alariana said sadly as her friend left. She just caught Nelia glaring at Fletcher's back as she went. So, um... Alariana wasn't sure how to continue after that. Alari Mama! Fletch repeated as he sat down at the table, swinging his legs excitedly. I made some new friends today! Oh, really? Alariana said, turning to fill Fletcher's bowl with stew. She was always wary of Fletch making friends. She didn't want him to be taken advantage of as she had been. Yeah, 
They're not from around here, and they came on a ship, and some of them have tails. Oh my, they sound interesting, Alariana said, placing a bowl of stew in front of Fletch before turning to the bread and starting to slice it. Yeah, and they had a ghost. He was so blue, he... Fletch paused, noticing Alariana had stopped cutting the bread suddenly and was staring at him. She didn't want to jump to conclusions, but couldn't help wondering if it was them. Uh, sorry, Fletch. Keep going, Alariana said, slicing the bread again. There was a knock on the door. I'll get it, Fletch shouted, bouncing off his seat towards the door. Uh, no, Fletch. There was no stopping that boy, and before Alariana could finish her sentence, Fletch had once again ripped the door open, revealing a very annoyed Abrian holding a turnip. There you are, Abrian shouted, looking as if he was going to throw the turnip at Fletch. Oh, hello again, Abrian, Fletch said, grinning his cheeky, toothsome grin. Alariana silently stared at her old friend. It felt as if all the air had been sucked out of the room. If Fletch hadn't just called him by his name, she would have convinced herself it wasn't really him. But it was. He was here. How did you find our house? Fletch asked innocently. Your normal volume is screaming, so all I had to do was follow your voice. Abrin glared. Is not! Alariana's grip on the knife she had been using loosened and it fell on the floor with a clatter, drawing Abrian's attention to her. Oh, Mr. Meet My... Alariana, Abrian said breathlessly. Shock was too tame a word to describe what Abrian was feeling. Alariana staggered back a bit and then ran around the table and hugged her old friend. Tears stung her eyes, the air came back into the room and she could breathe again. Abrian tentatively placed his arms around her, not sure if she was real. Down the street, Gina, Hono, Ie and Gie were walking in the direction Abrian had sped off in. He'd left without agreeing on where to meet the others, and after losing half their friends, the group were not in the mood to lose anyone else. Honestly, I don't know why a young woman like her would want to look after a monstrosity like him, they heard someone say. The words had been spoken by a woman, fumbling with a large set of keys in her doorway. G.A. bristled, knowing what it was like to be on the receiving end of words like that. E.A. looked at G.A., sharing the same feeling. Gina looked at the twins and wrinkled her nose. Hono, realising the lady was probably talking about Fletch, put on his nicest, totally not sleep-deprived face. <clears throat> Excuse me, madam, he said. Would you happen to know where the boy with a big back lives? Oh, what trouble has that boy got into now? The lady said, turning towards them with an exasperated look, revealing herself to be very pregnant. Hono flinched when he saw the bump. You're the second person to have come through here looking for him. Nelia then noticed G.A. and did a visible double take. He's not in trouble, we're just... No, that boy is always in trouble, Nelia continued, bringing her attention back to Hono. If not with you, then someone else. Miss, we just need to find our friend who was looking for him, G.A. said, becoming increasingly annoyed with this lady. He hadn't noticed he was growing less opaque as his frustration grew. Don't speak to me like that, you... thing! the woman said, annoyed G.A. had even dared to speak in his current state. Thing? Don't you speak to Joji like that, Gina said. I'm sorry, but how would you describe him? As a ghost and a failed notion, Gina said, glaring at her. Gina, please don't start issues, said Abrian, who had reappeared and pulled her away. He immediately regretted his words when both women and G.A. scowled at him. What's going on? This woman called G.A. a Thing, protested Gina. And she's being unduly aggressive towards me, snapped Nelia. Nelia, please, calm down, Alariana said, emerging from behind Abrian with Fletch at her side. Alariana? G.A. and E.A. said in tandem. You know the stress isn't good for the babies, Alariana said, hurriedly unlocking the door and guiding the irate Nelia into the house. G.A. and E.A. looked at Abram with raised eyebrows. After a little while, Alariana re-emerged, shutting the door quickly behind her before turning to stare at all of them, as if she could scarcely believe her eyes. How in the... what... why are you all... She could barely get the words out. It's cold and wet, Gina interrupted, sniffing through her curtains of sopping hair. 
We're busy trying to find a twerp who ran off, so please stop talking. Hono buried his face in his hands, but Alariana didn't seem to mind. Ah, I think I know the twerp you mean, she said. Fletch grinned. Please come inside. You all look... She paused, not wanting to say anything wrong. Just come inside. Alariana's house wasn't very big. Tucked away around a corner of the path and reached by a rickety set of wooden steps, its front door opened straight into a simple, slightly cramped room with a fire set low at the back where the remainder of lunch was still steaming. Still in a state of shock at her unexpected visitors, Alariana insisted they stay for the night out of the rain and spent a lot of time running around making things tidier, pushing piles of relaxed mess out of the way and arranging beds out of many layers of reeds. She had a large supply which had been meant for fixing the roof, but they also made deceptively comfortable bedding for unexpected guests. After a flustered search, she also found dry clothes for them to wear. This was useful for Gina, but more uncomfortable for the others who, once again, found themselves in clothes made for girls. At least these were shirts, an overcoat and cropped trousers, and not the long, elaborate snowman garments stored away back on the ship. Fletch watched the hustle and bustle from a corner, squatting on a chair and fiddling with his loose tooth. If he was bemused that his friend knew these peculiar strangers, it didn't show. At last, Alariana had done all she could and sat down, looking out of breath. I'm sorry, she said. It's not much, really. Don't be daft. How can we ever thank you? said Hono, pushing his empty bowl aside. Well, you all took me in when I needed help. This is the least I could do. Alariana muttered, picking at her fingernails self-consciously. I just can't believe you're all here, of all the places in the world. And you too, Joji. She smiled up at him. You're still a ghost then? No more stranger of magic? G.A. chuckled. Once was enough, thanks. I think messing with magic stones, potions and red moons is behind me these days. Quite right, we're not having you fall off any more towers, said Abrian sternly. G.A. grinned as if this had been a particularly cheeky mishap. "'When did you fall off a tower?' demanded Gina, but Hono elbowed her. Alariana watched Gina as she shoved her cousin away. "'Why are you both looking at me?' said Gina suddenly. Alariana blinked and her ears twitched beneath her scarf. "'I'm sorry, you look like someone I—' "'Oh!' Gina exclaimed as she remembered. "'You were that emotional person from the ruins!' she sneezed. Nice to see you, but please don't go all thoughtful or talk about all that. It wasn't fun. Besides, we'll never get anything done. Alariana looked a little surprised, then almost relieved. I've been trying not to think about it either. She frowned curiously. But you're, uh, not, um, small? You're... Gina aged physically when she punched her way out through the fabric of reality, cut in G.A. But then she got stuck in the moat because when she escaped, her element engaged to stop her turning into a ghost like me. Ie had to fetch her out because his green magic can make her go back to normal. And then she punched him. And I'll stop now, said Gie, slowing to a stop as he caught his brother giving him a very long look. Alariana shook her head with a smile. Oh, Joji, you are always strange. But I mean that in a good way, she added quickly. Um, so why are you here? Fletch told me he'd save you from being lost and starving in the middle of the hillside forest. That might have been a bit of an exaggeration, said G.A., glancing sideways at Fletch, who sniggered. The ATR and me are on an adventure! And he recounted all that had happened since she left. The rain starting, Nausians coming to Felnor for shelter, and Tepid and Abrian's plans. He was just about to be told to shut up, and she doesn't need to know! as he reached the park with the snowman. But a knock at the door did the trick before Hono or Ie could speak. To their surprise, Alariana and Fletch both jumped at the sound. Quick and quiet as a wink in the dark, Fletch sat in his chair properly, polishing the cord tied around him with his own spit. Alariana readjusted the scarf around her ears, then looked horrified as she saw G.A. watching curiously. Before he could ask what was happening, she'd hurried him out of sight and shut him in a cupboard, hissing for him not to come out until she said so. Then the door opened. The person who stepped inside looked like a handsome, weathered tree that had sat in high winds all its life. He was slightly stooped, though his face was by no means aged. 
He held himself so steady and firm, it seemed nothing could sweep him over. A small pouch was clasped in his thin fingers. Alariana ducked her head respectfully and looked over her shoulder. Fletch! Fletch slid off his chair and walked with his chin in the air towards the newcomer, his hand outstretched. The newcomer looked Fletch up and down, inspecting every part of the boy, the knots in the rope around him and his hunched back. Finally, he cleared his throat and handed the pouch to Alariana. Fletch lowered his hand, looking put out. Many thanks, sir, she said, passing the pouch to Fletch, who took it at once, feeling its contents which clinked promisingly. So, same time tomorrow to make up for the missed visit before, said the newcomer in a business-like tone. Though I apologise, I seem to have intruded upon company. His eyes fell on Abrian, Hono, Gina and Ie, who were still seated at the table. So, you must have come from the ship that arrived in our waters today. Oh, my apologies. Everyone, this is Tene. He's head of the village. Apologised Alariana. Tene's eyes took in each of them carefully, his gaze a little unsettling. I spoke to the crew of that ship this morning. We provided the supplies they needed. They were well-spoken and innocuous. Good people from the far city of Nausea, I believe, he said. They made no mention of others, however. There's been talk that some strange-looking little people came ashore by boat. Whispers of subnormalities. He looked sideways at Alariana. There's nothing wrong with them, I assure you, she said calmly. They're my friends from far away. They're travelling on a mission to stop the rain. Tinir's expression slid downwards and he heaved a great sigh. Uh, I have said before, this is our normal rainy season. It won't be stopped by the efforts of simple mortal men like you or me. Especially not ones so young as your friends. Excuse me? Hono had stood up. Yes, they were a bit young, but that didn't make them stupid. We are going to stop the rain. We haven't come all this way for nothing, and we're not going to travel the rest of the journey for nothing either. He caught himself, realising to his horror how emotionally invested he had become in the whole ridiculous adventure, and his face turned scarlet. How are you going to stop the rain? said Fletch, looking unimpressed. We're going to kick it in the face, blurted Gina, but Abrian cut across her. Ahem, <clears throat> we're searching for two extremely magical ingredients for a, um, potion poison pill. We think there's a gigantic creature that's been hibernating in the coldest ocean. It's waking up and heating the sea. We're going to use it to send the monster back to sleep. Fletch snorted. <laughs> that's stupid. I concur, added Tanir. So are you, muttered Fletch under his breath. It's not stupid, said E.A. defensively. It's written in an ancient book. We can't go wrong if we've researched it properly. And why are you on our island? Asked Tanir, looking increasingly unconvinced. Abrian explained. We've read this is the only place where you can find a phenomenon called the Goromasolcia. We need to find it and somehow take a piece back with us. Tanir folded his arms. That is a terrible idea. You're a bit of a butt cake, said Gina angrily. I am no cake. The Gorma soil shall are unreachable, and certainly not for the eyes of strangers like you, snapped Tanir. Gina glared at him. He was reminding her of her bossy older sister. She used to be very good at wrestling her older sister too. Alariana was wondering if she should step in, more for the sake of her house than anyone else. She knew the ATR were good at breaking things. Well, you know, we would really appreciate a guide to help us find the Gromasolcia. Any help would be greatly, said Abrian hopefully, but he needn't have bothered. Tanir seemed to have had enough and had already turned away. You won't find one here, he said, striding back to the door. You may stay on Nila if you must, but your task is futile. Rain shouldn't be stopped. It is not for dust like you and me to meddle with. Understand? 
I am trying to be kind. You're young. It's better you learn disappointment early, so you become accustomed to it for the rest of your lives. This was a bit of a heavy statement, and an awkward silence followed. Tanir stood breathing heavily, looking rather emotional. Alariana gently stepped forwards. You know, if you're having some personal backstory issues that you're dealing with, you're more than welcome to come over and have a chat about them later. Tanir pulled himself up with a small sniff. That might be nice, thank you, he said shortly, and with that he departed, the door closing with a snap. Alariana sank into the chair, looking relieved. Well done, Fletch, she said, untying the scarf around her head and shaking her ears free. Fletch was busy with the contents of the pouch, calculating how many turnips it would buy. When Abrian looked questioningly at the scarf in Ilariana's hand, she shrugged. On this island, there are some things that people aren't very used to. Ears like mine, they don't go down so well. What a funny idea, said Abrian thoughtfully. I know nauseans get iffy about failed notions, but that's because we booted out their prince. What's wrong with us here? Ilariana sighed. Nothing. I don't believe so, anyway. They tolerate me and Fletch as best they can, but if you walk around with your tails on show, Tenir might, um, have something to say. That's Guppa's things, said Hono, running his hands through his hair. We really do need a guide. Sounds like no local here will want to help the likes of us. There was a clink from somewhere behind them as Fletch started listening. We've only got two days, explained Abrian when Ilariana looked confused. And the first one's almost gone. A broad grin spread across Fletcher's face. Like I said, you're more than welcome to stay here, said Ilariana resolutely. I'm sorry I don't know any more about Gormasolces than you do, but I'm sure you work something out. Fletcher was now edging his way along the table. I'm not sure, honestly, said Hono dejectedly. But thank you so much, Hilariana. Fletch was almost at full stretch now, lying in front of them like a beached sea creature. Finally, Gina couldn't ignore him any longer. What do you want? she growled. Fletch yawned luxuriantly and looked around as if he had just noticed them. But underneath, they could tell he was feeling smug. Oh, so very smug. Ah. So... You need a guide, do you? Nobody said a word. Fletch grinned. The only noise that broke the silence was a little, muffled voice from inside the cupboard. Can I come out yet? 